Okay, let's see what you guys think. Question one, why the hell does he go meet the devil? So for this question, I heard three kinds of answers. The first kind was he goes into the woods at midnight to meet the devil because the author needs him to do it. Which is true, but that doesn't really tell us a lot of information. So why does the author arrange for this to happen? Or I should say, how does the author create this character and this situation in order for him to want to go meet the devil? So another answer I heard was he goes to meet the devil because some he heard from somewhere that maybe some of his friends and acquaintances and family members are secretly devil worshippers. And so he wants to go find out who these people are so that maybe he can stop them or he can avoid them. So he doesn't go into the woods to meet the devil. He goes into the woods to find out about the devil and his followers. It just so happens that the devil appears. Um, and of course, in the story, when he first appears, we don't know he's the devil. And maybe Goodman Brown didn't know he was the devil at first either. Uh, so this second answer is he goes into the woods to find out the truth and save himself and his friends and family members. The third kind of uh, answer I heard was that um, maybe he goes into the woods to find out the truth and maybe he doesn't meet the devil. Maybe everything he sees in the woods is a figment of his imagination. He's so scared that some of the people he trusts the most and likes the most are actually evil that his mind presents him with a dude who seems like the devil and the entire thing is imagined. It, this could be true, right? There have been medical cases of people not just like hallucinating, but also like the thing that they fear the most actually to them seems real. Um, so I think both of these answers are getting at the same kinds of ideas. Um, it, it's just that one is a bit more realistic and the other one is a bit more imaginary. But both are about Goodman Brown hearing about something or like maybe he, he uh, observes something and he wants to find out the truth. And also he believes that he is a good enough man to be able to endure the truth. He thinks he can handle the truth. Uh, do you have other thoughts on this question? All right, so question two, the story's use of nature. Um, so a few groups took this question and uh, we know that the story begins in town and then he enters the woods and the description is on page two. Uh, so he leaves town in high spirits with excellent resolve for the future. So he's very determined. Goodman Brown felt himself justified in making more haste on his present evil purpose. So he speeds up. He walks faster. Evil purpose does not mean that he is evil it means that he's going to do something that is unlucky or unfortunate or very risky. He had taken a dreary road, though like very gloomy and dark, darkened by all the gloomiest trees of the forest, which barely stood aside to let the narrow path creep through and closed immediately behind. It was all as lonely as could be. And there is this peculiarity in such a solitude, so when you are so alone, that the traveler knows not who may be concealed by the innumerable trunks and the thick boughs overhead, so that with lonely footsteps he may yet be passing through an unseen multitude. He could be surrounded and he would have no idea. So the picture of nature we get here is like dark, scary, maybe hiding things. It's also, it feels like a trap as one group mentioned, right? It, because 
the the forest barely lets him through and it feels like the forest closes behind him. So it's not just him being scared of the forest. It's also the forest actively scaring him. Uh, and then the author tells us uh, because of this situation, a traveler such as himself may be surrounded and have no idea. In fact, this is uh, Goodman Brown's own mindset. He's thinking, "Are am I being surrounded? Are there people? As it says in the next paragraph, there may be a devilish Indian behind every tree, said Goodman Brown to himself. So yeah, he knows he can't see it uh, around him. Um, so Indian, Native American, uh, we talked about last week how in this period, white people were often fighting Indians uh, over land and over political control. Uh, calling an, such an Indian devilish just means that the Indian would want to do harm to him. Uh, and he glanced fearfully behind him as he added, what if the devil himself should be at my very elbow? So not just an Indian. What if the devil shows up? And then, lo and behold, next paragraph, a man appears. Uh, in fact, in English, the phrase is, speaking of the devil, here he is now. Um, so this use of nature, as one group mentioned, is it's dark, it's scary, it's unknown, and the unknown leads to fear, and fear leads to dark thoughts. We can look at another example on page six. On page six, uh, the devil disappears. Goodman Brown, uh, just as he's about to lose faith, he looked here, he looked up to the sky, doubting whether there really was a heaven above him. Yet there was the blue arch, the arch is the sky, and the stars brightening in it. With heaven above and faith below, so like on earth my wife loves me, right? So with God and my wife as my support, I will yet stand firm against the devil, cried Goodman Brown. Um, and as one group pointed out, this is usually an invitation to the devil. Right? It's like, don't test me, and then you get tested. Or like, nothing bad will happen, and then something bad happens. So what happens? While he still gazed upward into the deep arch of the firmament, the firmament means the sky, but it also means heaven, and had lifted his hands to pray, a cloud, nature, though no wind was stirring, hurried across the zenith or the top of the sky and hid the brightening stars. Bum, bum, bum. The blue sky was still visible except directly overhead where this black mass of cloud was sweeping swiftly northward. So you're looking at the sky. It's full of stars. It gives you hope. And then suddenly this little black cloud comes and blocks the stars right above your head, even though there's no wind. And then it keeps moving. This seems like a very suspicious cloud. Um, and uh, Goodman Brown follows the cloud, and that's how he discovers the witches' meeting. Uh, so as uh, some groups mentioned, this cloud seems like an evil cloud. It hides the bright stars, it blocks his prayers to heaven, and it shows him his deepest fear, his fear that his wife is also a devil worshiper. Um, so in this case, nature is being used as a symbol for evil. Which is very interesting. Uh, it's connecting with the use of the dark forest, right? But at the uh, at the same time, nature is usually talked about as a creation of God. Why is nature beautiful? Because God created it. But in this story, nature is not on the side of God. It's on the side of the devil. A very interesting way to use nature. 
OK, do you have questions or ideas, further thoughts about number two? All right, question three, does the gathering actually happen and do you, why do you think yes or why do you think no? So the cloud leads him. Uh, and then uh, he sees like a, a glow of fire in the distance. There's a clearing in the woods. And then in this meeting, uh, he sees lots of like important and so-called good people, including people he just met. Uh, also like the governor's wife, elders of the church. And then finally, the climax of the story is bring forth the converts, people who are now who have decided to start joining this religion. And one of the converts uh, is his wife, Faith. Very dramatic moment. Uh, and then he kind of witnesses them like swear faith to the devil. He tries to warn his wife away, like look up to heaven, resist the wicked one. Uh, and then suddenly everything disappears. So did this really happen? Uh, one group took this question and they said no. They think that this is all uh, part of Brown's imagination. Um, building on an earlier answer where the, the woods make him scared and he thinks dark thoughts, these thoughts grow darker and bigger until uh, they become this very scary witch's meeting. And the thing that he is afraid of the most looks like it comes true. Uh, and then like the he, like maybe we can say when he reaches this climax, it is too much for him to take. And so he suddenly wakes up again from his imagination. That's possible. It's also possible that this meeting does take place. It's a witch's meeting. It uses black magic. So you would think like you've all seen Harry Potter, right? If they want to hide from us muggles, they have ways. Um, so. For letting him see the meeting, it could be a choice. And so the devil might want to show him just enough to change him. And then uh, he hides the meeting again. The idea here is that um, witchcraft is supposed to be actions that cannot be explained rationally. It doesn't fit common sense. So. Just because the meeting doesn't fit common sense, in fact, could be proof that it is a real witch's meeting, right? Uh, traditionally, witches are accused of doing things the opposite of how they are supposed to do. Uh, so, like, um, I can't think of any examples, but like um, swimming through the air instead of uh, walking, or like, uh, um, uh, gosh, I read this yesterday, but like like doing things like um, for example, they they could like uh, walk around standing on their hands instead of their feet. Um, they may uh, pretend to be a man when they're actually a woman, or the other way around. Uh, some men, very few, but some men were also accused of being witches. So like doing things the opposite way. Um, so just because the meeting doesn't seem to make sense does not mean it didn't happen. Within the logic of the story where witchcraft is real, I guess, uh, it could be a real meeting. But really, the story doesn't give us a solid answer, right? At, in the very last page, second to last paragraph, this is page 10. Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch meeting? Be it so if you will. So if you want to believe this, go right ahead. The story doesn't tell us. In fact, the story says whether or not it's real, it had a real effect on Goodman Brown. But alas, 
which means so unfortunate. What a pity. It was a dream of evil omen for young Goodman Brown. It was a dream that had a, a bad effect on him. A stern, which means serious, sad, a darkly meditative. So he often thinks dark thoughts, a distrustful, if not a desperate man, did he become from the night of that fearful dream? So if it were a real meeting, uh, then becoming this kind of man makes sense. If it were a meeting that he dreamed, then the dream made him into this kind of man. But either way, uh, this is now the kind of man that Goodman Brown is. Questions or ideas about three? So uh, like it could be real, it could not be, it could be a dream, but even if it's real, it could be a performance by the devil. It's a real performance. Um, you know, these kinds of like rituals or like public ceremonies are always a performance, right? If you go to a wedding, yes, the two people getting married really love each other, hopefully. But the entire wedding is a performance for friends and family, right? So even if the meeting is real, it's also being performed for Goodman Brown. Did I say wedding? The witches meeting uh, is being performed for Goodman Brown. Number four, what do you think is the point of the story? Very interesting that I heard a lot of similar answers. Uh, I think I can categorize them into two kinds of answers. One is that um, it's sometimes hard to fight against dark thoughts. It's easy to follow your dark thoughts into a darker place. And so if we find ourselves doubting some things that we used to believe or we start thinking uh, dark thoughts, we have to try to change our perspective. The answer is not like Goodman Brown to find the truth uh, because the truth will always be distorted by your thoughts. The best way to deal with dark thoughts is to change your perspective. So uh, maybe for Goodman Brown, if he starts thinking, what if people in the village are actually worshiping the devil? Instead of saying, I will find them and I will like, uh, you know, bring them back to God. He might think, oh, well, you know, they're not hurting anybody. Uh, nobody else seems to know. So like, uh, you know, if they want to go to hell, let them go to hell. But I'll keep myself on the right path. And maybe he wouldn't go crazy. Um, another answer that I heard was that this is a test of faith. Like, and this goes back to uh, question one. Why does he go meet the devil? What if... Well, the story says he has been married for three months, right? Uh, sorry. Uh, page two. What, my sweet pretty wife, dost thou doubt me already and we but three months married? So they've, they're young, they're newly married, it's been three months. Basically, it's the end of the honeymoon. So it's kind of when he has to come back to reality. So what if the story has him go meet the devil as a way to symbolize the fact that he has to face his new life as a married man? Or another way to say this is uh, he's slowly getting used to being married to this woman and he realizes that she is not, in fact, a perfect angel, that she is a human with uh, merits and flaws, with good side and bad side. And so the story tells us he goes to the woods to meet the devil, but it could be a symbolic story about facing the dark side of all humans, including his own wife, about having to face the reality of life and not just the imagined romance of a new marriage. 
So if we look at the story like this, then the point of this story could be that um, he faces a test. It could be a religious test. It could be a, a test of life. And he fails, right? At the end of the story, he trusts nobody. He behaves in crazy ways. So the point of the story could be don't take unnecessary tests. I know you're students and it's hard to do that. But like in life, if you don't have to do the hard thing, don't do the hard thing. If you're not sure what to do, don't like test yourself to find out. There should be better ways to make choices. Uh, and then like one other possible answer is that every person has a dark side. And instead of trying to fix that problem, you should try to accept that and take it as part of everyday life. Nobody is perfect, including yourself. One group said uh, the story tells us not to trust anybody 100%, including yourself. And yeah, that's pretty much true. Um, including, you know, people that you love, your family members, close friends, your teachers, everybody's human. Everybody will make a mistake. Um, even the best person will die one day. So it's not a good idea to trust somebody or some something. A uh, hundred percent. Ninety-nine percent is enough. Okay, do you have thoughts on number four? Okay, and number five, why is it set in the past? We get a hint from page one because it says that um, Goodman Brown lives in the village of Salem. Very first line, into the street of Salem village. And a footnote very helpfully tells us that this is the site of the infamous witchcraft trials of 1692. So like by setting the story in the past in this place, it is already telling the reader that uh, something related to witchcraft or religion could be important for this story. Um, so some of the groups I talked with also mentioned that it's set in the past because in the past, in this place, they knew less about the world and about their land, and so they were scared of more things, and so religion played a bigger part in their life. Not just um, uh, how much they believe, but also how they look at the world using the logic of religion. So today, if we see somebody doing something bad, we might think that they need mental health care or that, that they need to be locked up. We would not say they are witches that have to be burned or drowned. Right? That's more of a religious kind of logic. Um, another answer I heard was it, the story is set in the past because um, with that kind of distance, the author has more space to add some more unrealistic elements. For example, calling his wife Faith. Uh, his wife is obviously the symbol of all that is good and kind in the world. And so at the end, when he sees Faith worshiping the devil, to him it's like that last hope in life goes out. The last candle goes out. But calling his wife Faith, that's not very realistic, right? in this kind of story, but we accept it a little more because the entire story is set in the past. If the story is set today and we have a character named Faith who represents everything good, we'll all say that, you know, we, it's harder to accept. But with the distance of history, uh, you can do a, a little more unrealistic story design. So those are some possible reasons why. Uh, the story set in the past. And the second part, could a similar story be told about the author's time? The story was published in 1835. Last week, we talked about how uh, the, the 19th century uh, had um, expanding 
borders of the United States, developing more land, understanding more about this land, winning some wars with uh, the UK, uh, buying land from France. The United States in the 19th century was a growing country. It was growing in confidence. It was growing in economic power. There were there was the invention of the cotton gin and other machines, railroads, canals, technology. So technology means a better understanding of the world, and so there would be space for religion, but it would be smaller. Most people in the 19th century United States did still believe in God, but they didn't see the world through that such an intense kind of religious logic or perspective. So we could have a similar story about a main character who is tempted by dark thoughts and realizes that the people in his life are evil and untrustworthy. But maybe it wouldn't be about going into the woods to meet the devil. Maybe it would be about going into the factory to meet the manager or something, right? There, there would be some changes related to technology. Maybe he would go, he would go deep in the forest, but instead of discovering a witch's meeting, he would discover a devil's machine that does something very evil. Um, so this kind of story, I think, could work in any time period, but the details would have to change. Think about horror movies today. Uh, so many horror movies are now about like how your soul gets sucked through your phone screen or how you get addicted to the computer and you turn into a monster or something, right? So it's a it's the similar story structure, but the details change with the times. Um, and so thinking about this difference between the time of the story and the author's time can help us see what is truly essential to this kind of story and what can be changed to uh, make it more relevant for different kinds of readers. OK, do you have thoughts about these questions? OK, so let me briefly introduce next week's reading. Next week, we're going to read two very short stories by Edgar Allan Poe, Allan Poe. So let me talk a bit about this guy. He's a very interesting person. Edgar Allan Poe was also around the same time period, uh, I would say middle to late 19th century. He's best known for writing horror stories, detective stories. People say he invented the detective story. And also a really long and apparently scary poem called The Raven, Uya. Uh, the poem is about how a guy who is missing his dead girlfriend, and then suddenly a raven flies through the window and stands on a small bust or like a head statue uh, in his room, and the raven won't go away, and the raven keeps making a sound that sounds like the word nevermore. And so the guy gets more and more paranoid that the raven is telling him he will never find his true love again. And then finally he kind of goes crazy. So yeah, it's also a horror poem. Um, and Poe was famous for this poem because he really used a lot of rhyming and sounds to create a feeling of horror for his readers. It was very scary at the time. Today we read it, we think, oh, it's kind of cute. But at the time, it was very scary. Um, now, his scary stories, I personally don't think are like that scary, but they are pretty creepy, uh, even today. Uh, so I chose two of them. They're quite short. Added up, they are about like 10 to 12 pages in total. Not too much. Um, now, about the man, Edgar Allan Poe, struggled in life. Uh, he wrote these great stories, but nobody really thought they were really good. Um, he wrote, in, in addition to horror, he wrote about things like family tragedies, incest, luan luan, uh, and like all of these dark topics. He wrote about um, like drunk people doing crazy stuff. 
because he himself was also a drunk. Um, he famously died drunk in a ditch, Shui uh, Goli. Like he drank too much, fell in the ditch, and drowned. Uh, and uh, he also died poor because he was also a gambler. He spent his money on alcohol and gambling. So how did he? How did he become a great author? For this, we have to thank the French. At the time, France had a literary movement called symbolism, Shang Zhen Zhui. Uh, and the idea was that a poem did not have to make sense as long as the symbols made sense. So the literature in France at the time really cared about symbolism, emotions, creating a feeling for the reader. And like the actual story itself didn't really have to be about anything. Uh, and so when they read the work of Poe, um, I should call him Alan Poe. Uh, he was born in the uh, which one? He was born in the Allen family, and then his parents died, and he got his his father died, and his mother married a guy named Poe, or the other way around. He was born Poe, and uh, his mother married a guy named Allen. Anyway, um, so when they read Allen Poe's stories, they also found that feeling the that he was so good at using these images and symbolism to create an environment for his reader and create that that scary and creepy feeling for his reader and so the french thought he was brilliant translated him made him very popular and when the americans heard that one of their own authors was very popular in europe they were like who is this guy we have to find his stories and so he became uh, popular in america after his death um, so I think that's all you kind of have to know to enjoy his stories. The first one is about killing a man, and the second one is about killing a cat. Right. Um, so enjoy. Um, as I said earlier, I have to leave early today. So that's it. Class dismissed. See you next week.